16, 2024. Welcome to everybody. Uh, the first item on the agenda is public comment. And we had a speaker who was signed up, but she is unable to be with us. Oh, we today. do have a speaker, Miss Angela Kiavney. Oh, oh she is here. Okay. All right. Hi. You can go right up there. Yeah, go on up to the podium. Um, we've got three minutes to speak. Uh, on an item, technically it should have been an item on the agenda, but we understand you have just sort of a general topic about it's related, late. I promise. So we, we uh, got some good coaching from Elizabeth. All right. Um, so, ready? Good morning. Thank you, Angela Keveny. Um, yes, I'd like to come before you um, as a citizen, uh, specifically in reference to, uh, or overall in reference to the facade, uh, item number eight, the facade improvement. Uh, grant and how the, uh, the following will be related. Um, I would like to start off by uh, saying um, thank you for presenting the facade improvement uh, grant to the, uh, to the community and having this what, I think two years in a row. One particular uh, thought and suggestion would be for next year, um, perhaps we could include color options with a partnership uh, agreement uh, or um, pollute plan with some uh, Sherman Williams or someone of the like that provides paint and encourage folks to pick from paint palettes that um, are in line with some of the design and, and forward thinking where we'd like to take the take the uh, the look and feel of the resort um, and I say all this I should back up for one quick second um, I'm here before you as a citizen, like I said, don't own a business that has conflict of interest, et cetera, just care deeply about uh, Virginia Beach and Virginia. Um, I'd like to make sure I'm connecting you with conversations that I've personally been involved with um, under uh, RAC, a couple of RAC committees uh, over the past three years to bring awareness to you if, in case you're not aware. Um, and then, of course, a call to action, you as the um, development authority and your overarching mission and reason for being. Um, so with that said, uh, I talked about the idea for just colors, a small one. Uh, as far as how landscaping is involved in that, this does have a sidetrack into the um, city's maintenance programming um, and how that could be enhanced. Um, but more than just an aesthetic, I really strongly encourage you to think about what the, the risk management uh, and, and the the culpability we're taking on as a city when you look at Atlantic Avenue and the side streets in particular with regards to these ligustrum bushes that have been allowed to grow into trees. Um, I've had numerous conversations moving away from the aesthetic point of, 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 of uh, contention, if you will, and I ask you to just take a ride. At any given point where there's a tree, one of these bushes, um, it clears no more than about six feet to maybe six four. So I have taken pictures of gentlemen in particular who are that tall or in other instances 5'10 and their heads are coming up against it. Let's go bigger picture. We care about our tourists. Any given afternoon, evening, a dad wants to put their child on their, their backs and just simply walk down the sidewalk that they can't because of these bushes being allowed to encroach upon the um, walkways. So I ask you to think about that, that crowding that is unintentional, I can appreciate, but it is just an, uh, an accident waiting to happen. A kid gets hit in the face, crowding, we're getting ready to have, what, thousands, arguably, more people, um, and it's, you have to move, step to the side, duck, et cetera. And then lastly is um, the, our, uh, excuse me, the franchise agreement. Page 24 of the outdoor franchise agreement specifically says that the city has the right to, within 24 hours, notify an operator who's out of compliance. And our biggest hindrance to attracting, uh, one of the largest uh, hindrance to attracting uh, businesses uh, is that our, our outdoor cafes, our restaurants, and a lot of our hotels just are allowed to, uh, they're just, it's, our, our outdoor agreement is not enforced the way it could be. So I ask you to check out that page 24 to help our RMO office feel encouraged uh, legally, uh, I, I am at the next step looking to you wrap it up. I'm yes, sorry. I'm looking to speak with the uh, lawyer who helps in particular with that agreement to ask them to help you know, clarify and provide us 
better enforcement schedules and, and actually enforcing what we say. So with that, thank, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your feedback. All right. The next item on the agenda will be a review and approval of the meeting minutes from our last meeting, which was March 19th. Got a motion from Mr. Franklin. Second. And a second from Penny Morgan. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, next, we'll have a review of the financial statements for March 2024 from Blake. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Councilmember Renner. Um, I'm only a keynote speaker at these, so this was a nice little change. <laughs> All right, I'm going to be presenting the March cash flow for the PGA. I'm starting off, this is uh, essentially just a change in cash with the reimbursements from the city to follow. Uh, not too shabby, 21000 in interest income for the month of March. 14000 monthly recurring charge uh, for conduit management to Global Links. 56,000 Atlantic Park construction inspection and support services to MVP and legal services at Atlantic Park as well for 10,000 to Davis, resulting in ending cash at 4.8. The payments reimbursed by the city at Atlantic Park, we have venture draw number 13, 931,000 uh, in construction and progress to the entertainment venue, 1.28 million in offsite infrastructure at Innovation Park uh, to Architectural Graphics uh, Offsite Infrastructure, draw number five for 55,000. 6,000 to Kimley Horn for construction phase services and geotech testing to Vanass Hangin for 4.3. At Corporate Landing, utility construction, draw number 11 for 397,000 to Seabreezy. 27,000 to Vanass Hangin uh, for construction admin costs. Capital maintenance, no changes to the amphitheater, uh, still the same amounts held by the city and GBDA. At Human Services, we have the monthly lease payment of 47900 BB National, the February revenue, uh, the capital maintenance portion for 9000 And then you've seen the results of these two field investigations, one for 22.9 to HVA Architecture for the HVAC, and one for 54.5 to be to the NAS for stormwater inspection. The incentive and initiative accounts, uh, <coughs> not too many changes this month. We had the lease payment to Olympia Bendix for 11.8. That went up slightly um, due to this next item, the 2023 year-end operating expense and tax reconciliation to Olympia Bendix. This is a um, built into the lease, any, any operating expenses. <coughs> and taxes over a base year amount are trued up at the end of the year and then added to the monthly lease costs, um, divided by 12 and added to the monthly lease cost. So that is now 11.8 going forward until the lease ends in August. And ending cash ending at 2.3. The EDIP summary, we had 4.8 in available to award at the start of the month one EDIP Part A award uh, for capital improvements of 4,000. Uh, Hermes has an award based on 3.6 million in capital investment and 30 new jobs. And that one was approved last July, so they won't be able to submit for jobs until this July, but the capital improvement is uh, mostly um, per personal property and that's underway. And that leaves us at 4.8. At construction and progress, we have the same draw we've seen before, increasing the construction and progress at the entertainment venue to 17.1 million. And once again, Atlantic Park, the parking venue, uh, will be trued up at the end of the year when we receive the CDA statements. Any questions? All right, thank you. Any questions for Blake? No questions. All right, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda will be a request for approval of a resolution authorizing the issuance and the sale of VBDA's public facility revenue bonds. And we have Dana Harmeyer with the city attorney's office here. Well, commissioners, Vice Mayor, Governor Ermick. Uh, you have before you a resolution prepared by Bond Council. This would be, I believe, the 12th uh, time we have come to the VBDA for public facility revenue bonds. 
these bonds are specifically for tip funded projects so Atlantic Park the venue the parking uh, streetscapes uh, the acquisition of the Dairy Queen um, and then some other smaller tip funded projects so the maximum we're looking at is one hundred sixty eight and a half million dollars um, <coughs> and I'm here for questions uh, if you have any any questions for Dana? And this comes to us with a um, recommendation or approval from City Council. City Council will act on this tonight, um, but as you see, there's a support <coughs> agreement that's attached, and um, this, the agreement of trust that this is another in a series of ongoing transactions where the City Council and the VBDA have partnered um, to expand its capital program beyond what would otherwise be allowed by the city's charter limitation. Any questions for Dana? Dana, if you can't sell the bonds for uh, 5% or less, you don't do them? Uh, we'll probably delay. Um, we may come back if we think that <coughs> there is a reason to issue, but at a higher number. Um, you may recall in 2020, we were about to go to market in <laughs> March of 2020, yeah. uh, and the bond market uh, froze for a bit there. Um, and so we actually delayed until June. Um, it actually ended up being a much more favorable interest rate environment, but um, there, there is the potential of, of delay um, in any sort of authorization. So in, in essence, this resolution allows us to go to market. It doesn't specify exactly when. I mean, we've, we pegged, uh, I believe, May 15, 14, somewhere in there um, as a potential date. But if the environment is unfavorable, we can always delay. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Dana. Um, I will entertain a motion on that request for approval of the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of the VBDA's public facility revenue bonds. Motion. Got a motion from Mr. Franklin? Second. And a second from Winter. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. okay. All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, a briefing on the amphitheater season preview and updates. Are here today. Good morning. How are you? Uh, well, it's <clears throat> for one, it's hard to believe that I'm standing before you as we are going into our 28th concert season at the amphitheater. And I'm pleased to say that I still have good news to offer every year that I stand up here. So <clears throat> we're going to start with that. So I'm just going to go through a quick recap of, of what we did financially in 2023 and the number of shows. We'll talk about the year-to-date financial summary. Uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the capital improvements we did for 23, go into what's happening for 24, and then of course we'll end with our show announcements for this year. So last year we did 22 shows, which seems a little low. However, we still had over 235 fans come through the door and averaged over 10,000 people per show, which is a really solid number for, for amphitheater events. We also generated $2.18 million in taxes and rent for the city. And year to date, I could probably say that we've done 735 events. I think I've been there for all but four of those. Uh, we've had 7.3 million fans come through the door and we've generated $37.7 million in revenue and taxes to the city of Virginia Beach. Our capital improvements, last year when I stood before you, we were, we were recovering from, from a fire, uh, and we had a lot in the works, and we still managed to get a lot done that was outside of that event. So all of the improvements that you see here are 100% funded by Live Nation. Uh, we still keep investing in the venue just as much as the city does. So last year we finally included our stage LED screen, so all of our video is now LED. Uh, we're trying to constantly improve our efficiency and, and offer the fans that come through a better experience. So we've added additional points of sale for food and beverage so that people aren't waiting in lines because nobody likes that. Uh, and then we rebuilt lawn chair stands so that we can accommodate additional lawn chairs and try to make the experience a little bit better so people don't have to lug lawn chairs in and out of the venue anymore. So they can rent them on site. Uh, we're not allowing outside lawn chairs this year just to make it more efficient as they're coming through the security screening process, make it a lot easier for them as well. Moving forward into this year, and if you've ever sat inside, you'll be super excited that we're adding fans inside of the pavilion. So that's really gonna help with the airflow. And then we do have two projects 
um, that I will be dwindling down a little bit of that uh, capital fund that we just recapped, but uh, we have, we are replacing, this, the venue was originally built with 16 water fountains that are pretty obsolete at this point, so we're replacing those all with water bottle filling stations, which will be a much better add to the venue. Uh, that's budgeted at $67,000, with the BBDA portion being $37,979, and Live Nation contributing $29,240. And then we're also going to be replacing a walk-in cooler that's attached to the main concession stand. Uh, it's original to the building, so it's time to replace that. So we'll be tackling that project at the end of the season. And that's budgeted $320,000 with the BBDA contributing in $180,800 and Live Nation putting in $130,000, $139,000. Um, we're not just looking at ways to improve our fans, but as we continue to grow, so does our premium seat program. So we have, you know, we currently have boxes, but this year we're really adding something special. So we're adding what we call the rock box and the bamboo suite as opposed to the bamboo that we also love out at the amphitheater. So the rock box is being built outside of the pavilion. It accommodates 14 guests. And it's really going to give people an opportunity. It's really meant to be an entertainment space. It's got upgraded food and beverage, pre-ordering capabilities. And then the bamboo suite, these other renderings, they are under construction right now, can accommodate 18 guests. And same thing, it's really meant as an entertainment space. We've elevated our food and beverage, not just in general concessions, but a lot in our, for our premium seat clients. And then 2024 shows, so we have 25 shows that we've already announced. We have more announcements coming in the next couple of weeks. So I'm anticipating a really big season. We kick off the season with Hozier, May 15th, sold out. By the time we even hit July 1st, I'll have five sellouts at the theater. So really, really huge season this year. Some really fantastic artists that we have coming. Tyler Childers, of course, we're getting Morgan back here this year. We've got the Red Hot Chili Peppers coming, New Kids on the Block, Creed, Dave Matthews Band is back. Uh, we've got some really great things ahead of, ahead of this year. So really looking forward to the season and appreciate your support as always. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Oh, this is mayor has a question. Choir, did, did you <coughs> cover a lot of that or? All of it. Insurance sure covered all of it. That's yes. fantastic. Yes. This is amazing. Thank you. Yeah, we were, we were very pleased that we were able to uh, get the amphitheater. I don't think anybody noticed that we ever had a fire. We had 70 days to get it, yes, it was to get it <laughs> back and running. So uh, we had some really great support uh, from our friends at WM Jordan and, and a lot of other contractors that worked really hard and, and appreciate the support of the authority in the city. So thank you very much. Great report. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, any other questions? We appreciate everything you do, and looking at the, the list of folks coming, it looks like there's really something for everybody in the community and for visitors. So Absolutely. it's nice to have such a well-run amenity. Um, it's one of, and we've been going through all of our assets, all of the different properties that the development authority either owns or, or controls, and this is one that fortunately is so well run, we don't have to think about it a whole lot. So. Well, thank you very much. And, and as you know, as a company, Live Nation loves the city and loves the building, and that's why we keep investing in the property as well. So we're really pleased with it. Well, thank you very much. More to come. Yeah, more to come. Exciting season coming up. All right, next we'll have, um, speaking of our assets, <laughs> and we'll give an update on our um, parking garage assets. <coughs> Councilmember Wilson, Councilmember Remick, Madam Chair, members of the board, this is your final installment of the assets for the BBDA. We're going to be talking about your parking structures and representing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, representing parking management. We have Rob Fries here. Um, so if you have any questions about day to day operations, he will be able to assist answering those questions for you. <coughs> you have a total of seven parking structures a little bit over 5,700 parking spaces in total. Five of those parking garages are located in Town Center, two are at the oceanfront, and all of them are operated and maintained through the City of Virginia Beach Parking Management Office. In Town Center, you have those five garages total with 4,381 spaces. 
There are free parking spaces available. Certain spots are limited through time. Um, other spots are leased out for residential and commercial purposes. And the garages were built um, as part of various town center public-private partnerships. <clears throat> the VBDA is responsible for insurance, which is paid through parking management. And parking management is going to be responsible for your day-to-day -day operations and maintenance. The funds for these uh, parking structures are through the town center SSD and a dedicated CIP fund. Garage and elevator assessments for the town center parking structures are completed every three years. Your 9th Street parking structure it has three stories, is a total of 532 spaces. The VBDA has air rights from the second level and above in the garage. Uh, again, parking management is responsible for day-to-day -day operations, and the funds for this garage come from the Parking Enterprise Fund and a dedicated CIP. The last condition assessment for this structure was completed in 2023. 31st Street Parking Garage. This has a total of 610 parking spaces, while the hotel on 31st Street holds a total of 380 parking spaces from that structure. It was constructed in 2005 through a public-private partnership development. The VBDA owns the southern half, while the city owns the northern half of the parking structure. Uh, again, parking management um, is responsible for the operations and the maintenance. And these maintenance and operations funds come through the Parking Enterprise Fund, the dedicated CIP, and the condition assessment was completed in 2023 for this location. Any questions for me or for Rob regarding your parking structures? Any questions? I probably should have done this, but but at least I didn't, that the VBA owns the southern part and the city owns the northern part. Yeah. It seems like it's odd <coughs> situation, but... Alex can explain that. Alex one. can. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the same question. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with how we acquired the property in the first place, and there was a, there was a condemnation that resulted in litigation. Oh, yeah, I remember that. our ability to put some of the property to anything other than a public parking purpose. So it had to be cut up in that, admittedly. Okay. I, I remember the condemnation case, yes. Thank do you. we own it outright, or do we lease it? Okay, so we own that one. Yeah. Well, that, the, the two condo units over the various properties, the city owns one, the authority owns the other. Got it. And Pam, it looked like most of these, there's a fund somewhere that takes care of operations and maintenance so that we don't come out of pocket necessarily for that. That's correct. Correct. We appreciate the clarification. And I will say, I don't know how recent it is, but if you put in, because I like to figure out which is the quickest way to get here in the mornings, if you put in Weston, it'll pop up Weston Red Garage. So now on the, on the mapping, at least the mapping feature I have on my phone, it identifies each of the different colored garages in town center, which I thought was pretty cool. So, I don't know if that's new or if you guys are responsible for that, but I think, it, I think it's helpful, yeah. All right, any other questions for Pam or for Rob? All right. Rob, thank you for coming this morning. We appreciate all that you do. Thank you, Pam. Um, next item on the agenda <coughs> is a request for approval of a resolution regarding uh, putting a preservation easement over some property that we own along Crusader Circle and Emily. Oh, I was going to say, I think Emily's going to give us this one. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, so when our, we first started presenting that VBD assets to you, we started with the land assets, and the question came up specifically about this property, and this is a follow-up kind of from that. This is Oceana, what we call the last kind of piece of Oceana West. It's a 135-acre parcel zoned I-2. Right off London Bridge Road, Crusader Circle is the property address. Um, we acquired it in 1972 to facilitate the whole Oceana West business park development. Um, there's neighbor restrictions, APZ1 and noise zone restrictions here. 
but at the time, in order to develop the business park, um, there were a lot of wetlands, and uh, a lot of this was put into a perpetual deed restrictions for wetland preservation in order, as a result of some being filled to allow for development at the time. The deed restrictions date from 1996 and exist to preserve the property in perpetuity due to other wetlands that were filled. Um, and the wetland studies at the time indicated beyond that there's just mature forest wetlands here as well. Um, here's kind of a map, that red area is rotated now, the one the bridge on the bottom. Um, all the kind of hatched area are the perpetual wetland preservation easements and the deed restrictions. The blues and the um, oranges there are flood hazard zones. And then the dots that you see are um, riparian uh, Chesapeake RPA areas. So you know, there's a more hatching that indicates more wetlands. So the areas that don't have a, any kind of hatching or symbol on them, we're fairly confident if you would um, delineate wetlands there, that would find them as well. So it's not very developable. And the question came up but during our last asset presentation is if it uh, could be given to the city for permanent preservation. We're here today to um, indicate, you know, tell you what could be developed here, and the answer is not much. Outside of uh, soft foot trails, boardwalks, observation desks, wildlife management structures, educational signage, um, nothing that disrupts the flow of water on the site, basically. And the Navy, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, would all have to approve any changes to the site. So we're requesting um, for you to approve a resolution uh, to accept the preservation e easement <coughs> given to the city for the 135 acres um, at Crusadership. Great question. Or in fee, we, it, we're asking you to defer to whatever the city uh, they want to take the property if they want in fee or preservation. The result will be exactly the same, that this will be preserved, not be developed, and only pass through. And Emily, can you go back to the um, map? So the only area that looked like it was uplands or possibly dry enough to maybe build something on is that rectangle-ish. So are you being up here? There, is that it? Yeah, so this is surrounded by residential neighborhood as well and is across the, the drainage channel through Lynn Haven. So it's not really, wouldn't be very favorable for industrial development in any case. And, you know, it's a pocket here, and we're pretty sure if you would delineate it, there would be wetlands potentially there as well. And there wouldn't be any access up there right. either. You're crossing all the drainage easements and stuff even to get there. Yeah, so um, it, it really looks like this is not, I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's I-2, which obviously we would like to have more industrially zoned land in the city, but this looks like it's something that's just so hamstrung that it can't really be developed anyway. And as long as we are, um, you know, required to preserve and not develop, then we might as well pay this to the city um, for preservation purposes. I think if that's... Have you done a wetland delineation? So you know that's wetland? So, there, yes, there were previous ones done in the 90s, and we contacted a firm to come out and do another one, but then we found all these deed restrictions that preserve it anyway, and we didn't. And it was a costly delineation. We didn't feel it was worth the BBH resources to, you know, and something that I found is wetlands only grow, they don't get smaller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean how nature has a way of taking over. Yeah. Any maintenance costs? So um, we did give Parks and Rec and um, planning a heads up that this would be coming their way, but from what I understand there's not a lot when it comes to the natural preservation areas, maybe merely they're addressing fallen trees or hazards or would it make any sense just to carve out the wetland piece and then leave the other part I too for the whatever? Yeah. It looks like the only yeah the only dry part of that is cut well, off from half the site. Yeah, that left hand side. Yeah. I don't really care. Yeah. I two is just a good zoning for. Yeah, it really is. Building. I mean, that's the shame of it. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Rosemary, do you have any thoughts on that with it being I-2 zoning? Um, as long as there's not a lot of cost to keeping it, I mean, taking care of it. We're, we've had some people come before the council that wanted to donate stuff, and there's just more to take care of and more to maintain, but this doesn't sound like it is. 
can you go back to the aerial? It looks like it, I think it's mostly forested wetlands, right? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, it would be a nice area to preserve, I would imagine, if you're <coughs> living in the neighborhood that backs right up to it, the only dry piece that you prefer for that not to be developed. Do you have a comment? I'm just curious, maybe I missed it. Um, what is the downside to just leaving the status quo? Um, to my knowledge, from the staff perspective, none, but it's, it was really kind of a, a request that came out of the assets um, by your council liaison. Yeah, so we had a request from our council liaison to see if this was something because it can't be developed if it's something that we could put into preservation. Or more passive recreational use yeah. than it's currently. It's worth exploring. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions for Emily? All right, hearing none, then we'll, I'll entertain a motion on the request for approval of a resolution uh, requesting mm -hmm. that the City of Virginia Beach accept a preservation easement either an easement or in fee, as um, Alex indicated, to give us a little bit of uh, flexibility. Uh, see if there's, how the city would like to accept this property from us that really can't be developed. Motion. We've got a motion from Mr. Parker. Second. And a second for Gunter. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say sign. That motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Emily, for bringing that to us. Next item on the agenda is Town Center, a request for approval of a resolution extending the term of Town Center option agreement between the authority and Town Center Associates. And this is Chuck. Good morning, Commissioners and uh, Vice Mayor, uh, Mr. Uh, this is a request to extend the uh, Armada Hoffler uh, Block 2 uh, agreement. And let's see if i um, Okay, there's our disclosures. It is TCA uh, Associates, which is Armada Hoffler. Uh, the background on this is that back in uh, 2000, we began to assemble these parcels. This particular parcel was added uh, in 2009. It's the site of the former Beacon building for those of us who've been around a while. Uh, the option fee is uh, the imputed real estate taxes plus costs <laughs> since 2009. Uh, TCA has paid uh, $553,897 for uh, this option agreement, um, extending three years at a time. Uh, if you were to project our taxes over the next three years uh, using uh, a, a, an appraised value that we just got uh, of $4.2 million uh, and using $1.42, which is kind of a, could be two cents more, uh, $178,920 is what uh, we would make over the next three years for this particular block. Uh, here is the block. It's currently being used for parking. And I think everybody knows that uh, with the Taco Bell on that corner selling so many tacos, uh, the approaches that have been made in the past to acquire that property and really kind of get a, a really good assemblage here uh, haven't uh, been able to really get any traction as yet. Uh, so we last extended this in 2021. The option, current option agreement expires at the end of this month. Uh, at the request of council, we did get a reappraisal just to see what it's worth, and we came in at about $4.2 million. The conditions to exercise this option by TCA is that they would pay us $4,792,735, which is the price that we paid to acquire it back in 2009, and they would also have to present a development plan uh, acceptable to the city and the PPDA. Some context here, uh, clearly um, the, the Taco Bell, as I pointed out, uh, one acre, uh, current assessment is 3.4, but again, uh, it, it is a uh, rockin' Taco Bell, I guess, and uh, they are not you know, interested in, uh, in selling at this point. And again, that maximum value is to put those two properties together. Uh, at some point and, uh, and, and try to do something of significance. Uh, our mixed use district, uh, with the help of Vermont Hoffler, 620,000 square feet total in retail, 800,000 of office, 760 apartments spanning 17 blocks and 25 acres, and the current total value is estimated at north of $550 million. Context for Mata Hoffler, it is a real estate investment trust, publicly traded, 40 years of experience here in the area, clearly a big company for us to be uh, housed here at Town Center. Uh, they are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, 164 employees, uh, so it is a, uh, 
a really great company that uh, has really helped us here at Town Center a lot. All right. Can you get that, Anna? Thank you. So the extension request is for three years under the existing terms, and again, at some point, an office tower, not now, but at some point would be what would uh, most likely be presented to us. Uh, so with that uh, is the request for to renew as as requested by Armada Hoffler, TCA. I don't think any questions you all have. Any questions for Chuck? We, um, in, in the past, we've talked about this, and this is something that would also go to council, right? So we would. The council has been made aware of it. Okay. All right. So we would, I guess, make the recommendation, and they would sort of concur or not with our recommendation. Is that right? You're. you're Resolution is only effective if council adopts a similar resolution. Right. This is one of the things that we fix when we move your case to the second Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. That'll be good. All right. Any questions? <coughs> we did relook at it and do an appraisal to make sure that it, we were keeping up with the times. Yeah. And it looks like the option price is actually higher than, than the is. appraisal. Which is great. A little bit surprising, but yeah, yeah. And really, strategically, it's an important puzzle piece, and needs well, to really be developed. And, and, you know, with again, that. we want to obviously everything we do anymore, especially here at Town Center, we want to maximize the density. And I think just waiting it out a little bit longer with our friends at Armada, they've already paid a significant sum of money. Uh, if it went off the tax rolls again, you know, we would lose out on the years of real estate tax as well so just makes some sense to wait it out a little bit longer and see what uh, see what the next three years look like so. thank you Chuck um, with that I will entertain a motion on the request for approval of a resolution extending the term of the town center option agreement between the authority and town center associates for block two. So moved. I've got a Motion from Mr. Keplinger, and then I'll take a second from Mr. Bronke. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Next up, we'll have a, a request for approval under our facade improvement grant program. Okay, good morning, Madam Chair, Vice Mayor Wilson, Councilman Rimmick, members of the authority and guests. This is a request for a resolution to approve two uh, grants for the amount of $16,777 under the Facade Improvement Grant Program. In March, the authority approved 14 grants. Today, we have an additional of two grants. This map shows a disbursement of the total grants within the city. First edition is MPN Group LLC, located at 3079 Brickhouse Court. Uh, they are the owner and tenant. They also are a tenant at Virginia Beach School of the Arts. They had a rank of four. They're located in District 3, and these are the disclosures. Project specifics are to inspect and replace wood as needed on all units, replace and wrap new windows and doors on all units, replace fascia boards, vinyl siding, and paint all units with a new sign. Their estimated investment is $136,985. Our recommended grant is $10,000. And lastly is Intercoastal Assets LLC trading as IX Contracting. They are located at 194 Bells Road. They also have a rank of four located in District 6. These are the disclosures. And the project specifics are to paint the exterior with two new parking lot lights for an estimated investment of 16142 with a grant recommendation of $6,777. Staff recommendation is to approve the two award requests in the amount of $16,770. This will exhaust the FY24 funds and close the online application for 24. 
We do intend to keep the website open and accessible for people to find out information about the FY25 program, and you can access that information via the link or QR code. The total impact for this year's program is 16 applications approved with an award of $126,320. The total estimated private investment is $530,861. Any questions? Any questions for Deborah? It's a great program, and I think it, to, to the speaker's point, whatever we can do to help sort of give the city a facelift and help our businesses to improve their exterior uh, is really good overall for the, for the city and for the citizens. Investment. All right. Hearing no questions, I will entertain a motion then on the request for approval of a resolution uh, approving these two FIG grants in the combined sum of $16,777. Motion. Got a motion from Mr. Second. Franklin and a second from Gunter. All in favor say aye. 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 All in favor, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you for bringing those to us. Next item is a request for approval of a resolution authorizing a sublease in the international incubator space. Good morning, Vice Mayor, Councilmember, and Madam Chair, and members of the authority, bringing you a recommendation for the international incubator from Cassiopeia Space Systems. Look at the disclosures. And a little bit about the company. So they were started in 2021 by an Israeli company and two U.S. companies. They design and manufacture equipment for the space and satellite industry. Their first product is a low earth orbit tracker used to improve satellite communications. So they initially set up in the west part of the state. However, that wasn't a fit. So they are looking to relocate to an area with improved manufacturing infrastructure, quality workforce, and additional market opportunities. Um, this company was introduced to the department by the Virginia Israel Advisory Board, which is a state government agency, which among other things, helps facilitate relationships between Isra uh, Israeli companies looking to enter the US market. As a reminder about our international incubator, this is a soft landing spot meant for international companies needing one to two offices initially, recognizing that most international companies will start with a small sales presence before growing to larger operations. The first tenant was improved, uh, approved in September 2021. Cassiopeia Space Systems is looking to lease one office out of the international incubator here at the sublease terms. The sublease is for a maximum of two years. And the recommendation is to approve the sublease for Cassiopeia Space Systems. Any questions for Paige? How much space do we have left after this? So there's 12 to 13 offices with the expansion. This will be the fifth office leased. In addition, we have two virtual tenants that come in and out about quarterly. There's still a good bit of space. We're heavily marketing it. That's great. Well, it's been very successful space for us, getting businesses to sort of get a toehold or a foothold and then expand out of there. All right, any questions for Paige? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to enter a sublease with Cassiopeia Space Systems uh, for international incubator space. Motion second. from Mr. Brecky and a second from Oregon. All in favor say aye. Aye. All for the same sign. Next, we're uh, at the administrative information portion of our agenda. Any items to address from uh, VBDA members? All right. Hearing none, I've got two things that I wanted to mention today, or actually three. First of all, I wanted to welcome Amanda Jarrett. Who is our new? Yeah, Chuck was going to do it. I just didn't want to forget our new deputy city manager. I'll let him do a further introduction. But she's uh, she'll be working with us in economic development, in addition to public works, planning, planning. economic development, tourism, and agriculture. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll let Chuck do a better introduction. Sorry, I didn't want to forget it this time. <laughs> okay. The next item that I had um, is. Uh, Mike Standing had asked, and we thought it would be a good time to do a strategic planning work session. Um, this ties in pretty well with uh, 
some things going on in the uh, city manager's office, the discussions they're having, and some uh, discussions that are going on about affordable housing and maybe what role that the development authority could have, as well as just strategic planning generally. So we're going to try to line that up, and it would be a, a special session, work session, in either May or June. So stay tuned for some um, questions. We're going to try to schedule it um, to get Ruthie Hill come to speak with us about uh, affordable housing, and then we're going to try to pull some other pieces in. So stay tuned for that. That is something we'll be looking at. Um, one sad note, as some of you know, Joe Strange, uh, who was a development authority member for 10 years, uh, just rolled off last August. He passed away a few weeks ago. Very sad, very sudden. Um, Longtime business owner in the community, and somebody who had been a, um, a, a one of the best volunteers probably that the city has had. He was on the planning commission. I know it's David Weiner, or actually before David got there, but he was on the planning commission for 10 years, and then here for 10 years. Many of those as the vice chair. Um, just a, a great guy and a wonderful person and volunteer and. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a sad loss for our city, so our, our condolences to his family. Um, it's, it's, it's tough when that happens. We've had a couple of those, and it's, it's always hard. So I um, think, about, think about Joe and all the things that he's done for us and maybe how we can be better volunteers in his memory. Any, any thoughts from commissioners? That was all that I had, and I'll keep it over. Sorry, I, I saved the sad news for right before Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, wow. Well, that's quite a long uh, bit of service, so it was really good to mention. Uh, and good service to the city, but I'm delighted uh, to have uh, Amanda Jarrett join in uh, the city. I've known Amanda for a few years here, and uh, as a friend and colleague, but this is our first chance really to work together. So, uh, Amanda, um, we're really glad to have you on board. Looking to move sometime in yes, the summer. Yes, in June. Yes. So currently in that transition with children in school and all that kind of stuff. So, Amanda, you want to say anything? Sure. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I look forward to, to getting to know you all better. As Chuck said, um, Laura and Chuck and I have had the opportunity to work together for quite some time, um, arm's length, but it'll be nice to work with them on a daily basis. I've really received a wonderful welcome from the entire city staff and the community at large, and, and I'm happy to be here. Um, June can't get here quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Uh, the other thing, I'm going to let uh, Paige Fox break this news, but it uh, just came out publicly this morning, but we did some really good work, and uh, Paige, you want to... Sure. sure. Um, so for the last few years, the department has been working with the Oceantic Network, which is the leading um, industry organization for offshore wind in the U.S. Um, for the past three years, we've been working with them um, on many activities, training for local businesses, as well as smaller conferences, um, international delegations. We are excited to announce that their large offshore wind conference, it's the largest in the U.S., one of the largest in the world, is coming to Virginia Beach in 2025. Um, really excited about that. A lot of y'all re might remember the pre-IPF conferences that we've held here, where we get some of those attendees to Virginia Beach before they go to the next location. Um, but we should have 2,500 um, offshore wind attendees, um, business prospects in the city next year. So we're really excited about it. And the news just broke this morning. That's fabulous. Great news. And great work in attracting them and staying on top of it so that, that we were top of mind when they we're looking for their next location. So, in fact, uh, I think it's next week yes. is the show in New Orleans. So uh, we're going to be following New Orleans. So it's going to be uh, uh, he's going down there, and who else is going down? The Cinte and Charles from um, our international representatives. No, no bus taking people from here to. No, no <laughs> bus this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit too far to drive. <laughs> a couple other things I just wanted to mention. We do have a. Dominique Dubois is joining us on the 28th of this month. The last day in Hampton was yesterday. So really excited to get her in here to join uh, our new guy, Jaden, over there, mm -hmm. uh, who's really hit the ground running, by the way. It's uh, great to have you on board, Jaden, as well. And then our golf tournament's coming up on May the 3rd. So if, if you uh, would like to participate in that or help us sponsor it, uh, uh, Jeff Smith is handling that for, for the department. So uh, it's always a good time. And, um, 
Have you planned? I've already sponsored. Yes, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> Please, it's always a good time, and uh, it's, it's great to uh, be out there. And I, I really enjoyed it last year. I'm so respectful. I did a small part for your guys. So. <laughs> That's it. All right, thank you. Any questions for Chuck? All right. I think that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Contracts. Discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds, including interviews of bidders or offerers, and discussion of the terms or scope of such contract or discussion in an open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A30, and that pertains to District 2. And second, publicly held property discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body Pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A3, and that pertains to districts 2, 5, and 6. So I'll need a motion, a second, and a roll call vote. William Brunke? Yes. Taylor Franklin? Yes. Eric Keplinger? Yes. Jenny Morgan? Yes. Lisa Murphy? Yes. Tony Parker? Yes. Mike Sanding? Yes. Dave Wiener? Yes. Senator Wise and Seal. Yes.